Hello, welcome to part three of the video on my 6502 homebrew computer. Apologies if there's any background noise. As you can see, there are a few people going for a little jog in our back garden. But if we come back down here, look at the board. See, it's a little bit fuller than last time. Um, the processor and the um, ROM and the RAM are as before, but now we've got these two chips down here. This is um, a 6522 uh, versatile interface adapter, uh, which essentially provides, um, I think it's something like maybe 16 GPIO pins and a couple of uh, special purpose pins. And down here, we've got um, the 6551, a synchronous communications interface adapter, which essentially is a serial port. And you can see here we've got the CAN, which is the serial port crystal. Um, the serial port I've got wired up to this little module here. And this little module is a FTTI a USB to serial adapter because uh, my loving laptop over here uh, comes from the modern era when you don't actually have um, serial ports anymore on laptops, as it were. Uh, you also notice that I've got a little wire coming from bit zero of port B uh, all the way over to an LED uh, connected down to ground like this. And that will come useful in a demo I'm going to show later. So let's see where we are at the moment. Well, previously on videos, I just about managed to get um, some code up and running on the processor and showed you that it was looping around. Uh, well, this time I've actually managed to get a basic operating system up and running. So I'll show you this. So first of all, you need to start the um, serial monitor. There we go. Oh, can't uh, start it because I haven't plugged in the uh, the serial cable. That was silly. Let's try and get it around the right way. There we go. Excellent. And now I'm going to power on the computer and hopefully we should get something on the screen. Yes. And now I've cut to a screen capture session because that's slightly better quality than shaky cam. And I'm going to show you some uh, demos of where I am at the moment. So if I switch the computer on, you can see that the serial console comes up, which is wonderful. And we've got a very basic sort of command driven operating system now on the computer. Um, you can see the star prompt there and you can type commands uh, and edit them like this. And of course, if it's a non-existent command, it tells you. Uh, we've only got a few commands. One of them is a very simple um, echo command that just prints out the command line arguments like that. And that's just basically a test to make sure that my uh, assembly code is, is working roughly correctly and my tokenization code as well. So for example, you can put lots of spaces. Like that, and it should do the right thing. It's all very basic stuff, but uh, useful to try and get right. But the most useful command is probably dump, which lets me look at um, an area of memory. So if I were to just dump zero page, you can see there we are, or dump the first page of the ROM. It looks like this. Um, the memory mapping is uh, set up as well, so that um, some of the I/O devices appear in memory. Um, I'll talk about exactly how that works um, after the, the demo. Um, but the two commands which can be used to uh, control that are peak and poke of the old store. So dump lets you look at a, a whole load of memory, but a peak lets you look at an individual one. So you can see that the uh, first byte of ROM is a uh, 4C. And so if we just peak at E000, you can see you get 4C out. But we can also write to memory locations. So the um, uh, GPIO pins actually appear at the address DFE0. So if I were to dump the uh, the 16 bytes about DFE0 like this, uh, you can see there's just some stuff there. But the first four bytes are ones of interest to us. The byte at DFE0 is um, what will appear on port B of the output and the byte at DFE2 is the direction of 
port B. So if there's a zero at the corresponding bit of DFE2, then that uh, pin is an input, and if there's a one, that pin is an output. Uh, now, as I showed you, I've got a LED wired up to uh, bit zero of uh, port B of the VR, and I've got a little inset video there showing you what the LED looks like. And we can control that directly if I peek, if I poke rather, um, some values in. So first of all, I need to set all the output pins of to output, all the pins to output rather. So that's DFE2, and then if I set that to FF, they should all be set to output. We can just check that. Uh, by having another look at the uh, memory around there, and we can see that indeed we've set the data direction register to all outputs, and then we can just um, switch on and off the the bit zero in that register, which is of course uh, setting it to one or zero, the uh, the whole value of the byte. So if I set the value of the byte to one, the light should come on, which it does. and zero which come off which is good so i've got sort of very basic gpio wired up which is good because this is going to be what i'm going to build on to make some more io uh, the final bit of the um operating system that's been set up is a very very simple and quite buggy implementation of x modem which lets me receive files directly from my laptop into the memory of the device um, as an example I've got um, a very simple little Hello World program. So if I open this, um, you can see that um, it's a very, very simple assembly language program. Essentially, there's a segment at the start of these um, assembly binary. Well, the linker puts whatever is in startup at the beginning of the file. And in this case, it's just going to be a jump to the main function. The main function will be somewhere else in the file. And uh, all this does is load zero into the X register load the accumulator from the xth byte from hello world uh, check to see if it's zero if it is it jumps straight out um, otherwise it jumps to this put c routine which is actually provided by the operating system which outputs a character to the console and uh, increments the x register and down here we have a data segment uh, which is created by the assembler again and it's just the bytes hello world followed by uh, an ASCII new line and carriage return, and then the zero byte. Um, we can compile that with make, um, or we could actually, if I remember to set the uh, location of the compiler. I'm using the CC65 compiler, uh, which provides a, a really nice assembler as well. Apologies for the noise. I think someone has just decided to run themselves a bath. If I go back to the serial console, um, that program has been compiled to uh, hello world.bin, which I can send directly into the memory. So if we just have a look and see what hello world.bin looks like. Uh, oops, bin. Uh, so it's very short. Um, it starts with the bytes 430350, which is the jump to location 5003. Um, and that reflects the fact that these should be loaded into location 5000 hex in memory and then jumped to, which we can do um, using our operating system. So uh, xrev rex, rex is the x modem receive command, and I can send a file using this terminal emulator program. And then it's appeared, and we can just check it is there by dumping the first page from 5000. And we can see that our appropriate bytes are there. The 1A bytes, by the way, are just an artifact of the way that X modem works. You can only transfer sort of units of 128 byte files. Um, it's not really the best file transfer protocol, but it is very, very quick and easy to write in assembly, which was the important thing. We can call that program now if we go to 5000. And indeed, Hello World has been printed out. Um, I've also got a very simple linking program uh, which uh, does peaks and pokes one and zero into our via as we saw um, all of this code is available on github if you want to have a look at it and um, look at it in a bit more detail but essentially um, we know that the the via is exposed as 16 memory map registers the way I've set up the memory map which uh, I'll talk about in a moment um, is 
by having 16 byte IO areas, and there are eight of them, and they um, up, up, occupy a region of memory. Uh, the linker exposes which region of memory that is from IO, double underscore IO underscore start, um, and the VIA is at the seventh one, and as we count from zero in computer science, that means six, we need to add six times 16 bytes. And here is the uh, the two registers. The output register is at the beginning, and the data direction register is the, the second register in, well, the third register in, or the register offset to. Uh, I'm not going to go and talk through the whole program because it's uh, quite boring. There's a, a very hacky wait loop down here, which essentially just counts to uh, 10,000 hex using the X and Y registers. But the actual core of the program, you can see that we load one into the accumulator, store it into the output, wait for a bit, load zero, store it in the output, wait for a bit, and then loop back. So we can run that program. Like that. And then we can call it. And then hopefully you see that the LED is blinking. Which is nice. Uh, it uh, shows that the sort of IO is, is basically working. Although we can only exit the program by um, hitting the reset button. So let's uh, hear a little bit more about how the memory map actually works. Right, this is the uh, memory decode circuit. Uh, it's a very simple decode circuit, and you can see the memory map down there at the bottom. But the, uh, the basic idea is that um, we have two control lines, RAM cell and ROM cell, which uh, activate the RAM and the ROM chips. The RAM chip is really, really easy because the RAM basically switches on whenever A15 is low, whenever you have a sort of the bottom 32K of memory. Uh, and because the inputs are sort of complementary, that means that when A15 is um, low, the RAM will switch on, which is quite convenient. And uh, the ROM cell is very similar. Uh, it's, it just checks to see whether the top three bits are set uh, with a four input NAND gate. And if so, uh, the top three bits being set will switch on the ROM, uh, which basically means the ROM occupies the top 8K of memory. Uh, the reason I'm using these sort of 4000 series chips is because I happen to have some lying around. Um, in fact, I think they may be even date from the 80s because I inherited them in a big box of joy. So uh, there's no real reason why I couldn't use some 7400 series logic here as well. And um, the next bit of decode gets a little bit more complicated. So uh, U6B there, the AND gate, uh, is used to select when we're going to move into the I.O. region. Now the I.O. region um, is eight 16-byte regions starting from uh, hex DF80. And the way we do that is essentially make sure that the um, bits A8 to A15 are high, apart from A13, which should be low, and A7 is high. Uh, that If you work all this out, um, it basically means that we get the right area. And the reason I sort of chose that is because it made the, the circuitry easier. So U6B essentially selects for um, A12 being high and as not being in the ROM. And that's what the sort of feedback is from there. Uh, the reason I'm doing that sort of strange feedback rather than just sort of going and not A A13 is because um, I didn't want to waste um, a not gate didn't have that many chips lying around, so this is just more to reduce the chip count. And then the U6A AND gate, uh, NAND gate, just checks to see that A9 to A11 are high. So uh, that combined with A7 essentially chops us into the, the highest region in memory that's not the ROM. And uh, this turns out to be um, 8 times 16 bytes sitting up there. And then the uh, 74138 is a 3 to H decoder chip, so it takes the next three bytes of the address space, A4 to A6, and decodes them into eight separate regions, which are IO0 through IO7. Uh, the uh, serial adapter sits on IO7. It's uh, wasting a little bit of memory at the moment because it's taking up 16 bytes and there are only actually um, four control regi registers. So I might put a bit more logic on there to, to open up a hole for maybe a second serial port to sit. And um, the VIA sits on IO6, so that's why uh, we had to poke into the values DFE0 uh, through to DFEF. And those are where the memory map registers of the VIA sit. Okay, um, coming back to the console now, we 
have uh, a few programs that have been ported. Uh, you saw that uh, you can write programs in assembly and there's a version of basic available called extended basic which you can uh, compile and I've ported it to the sort of IO routines that we have at the moment which is essentially output character and wait for character. Uh, unfortunately I can't link you to the source of this because the basic information itself is, is non-free so uh, I, but suffice it to say that the amount of porting was required to just implement the get character and put character functions which you can see we already have. So I will load that now so I'll just quit from the terminal animator and change directory because actually we are in uh, here I think. So I'll restart the terminal animator, might as well reboot the machine, good measure. And now we can um, xrec again into 5000 and the file is very basic. Oh. Fortunately the, uh, the terminal animator program is less good than the, uh, the command line I've got on the actual computer because I can't press backspace when I'm sending the file which is annoying. Oh, I spelt it wrong in the web again. Right, and it's sending now. You can see that it's it's relatively fast to send a file if you can call sort of uh, two kilobytes a second fast. Um, but now we can call it and we're into basic. Oops. Ah. Try to jump to uh, some uninitialized memory. Right. Uh, we'll let it work at the same memory size. There it is. Um, and we can check that it works. If we do print hello world space 20 go to 10, 20 go to 10. Check we got the file. Yep, and run it. And there we go. All the hello worlds coming out. Uh, you can do uh, all of the sort of I/O memory mapped I/O from Basic as well, which is quite nice. Um, so. And 10 we can poke uh, into the fe2 value of ff and we can poke into the value of dfe0 fe0 the value of 1 and if we run that program the light comes on as you can see which is very nice uh, you can also write a blink program in BASIC, but you don't want to see me uh, typing in BASIC here. Um, but I'm sure you can see it. Go, oh, well, in fact, why not? We'll do it. Um, I'll make a wait subroutine at line 1000. So that'll be go sub 1000. Uh, 40 will switch the light off. And then uh, 50 will wait again. And 60 will go to 20. And then I need to make my wait routine, which will be really simple. It'll just be for i equals 1 to, I don't know, 500 next i. And then return. So if we look at our whole program, that's basically our entire program. It should hopefully blink the light. Let's try. Yes, indeed. There we go. We have a blinking light. So basic is working, which is nice. So we can start to write some programs. Um, Obviously, I'm going to sort of try to build more hardware than just a blinking light on top of this, but it's nice that that is sort of basically working at the moment. Um, we will take the final example, which is um, actually being able to run C. So I've um, got a very simple C program here, um, which is prints the Fibonacci numbers up to about 4 billion. And you can see that um, it's not the most pretty C in the world, but uh, the CC65 compiler comes with a sort of portable console I.O. library, this con I.O. header up here. And um, porting that is, again, very easy. You just provide the implementation of, of put character, get character, wait for character, that sort of thing. Um, and this is a um, sort of simple example of, of doing sort of non-trivial integer computation um, because these are obviously unsigned longs are 32 bit numbers uh, which means that there's a sort of more complicated addition going on than just a single add instruction um, but that gets compiled to fib.bin so we can upload that uh, we should, what we should do is we should change directory actually Anyway, 
as well reset while we're there just so we know. Excellent. Um, so crack 5000 fib.bin. Now you can see that uh, there's quite a bit of overhead of using C, and that tiny little Fibonacci program has got two kilobytes. But then that's because if you look back at the C code, um, it's got to pull in a full sort of um, printf implementation and the ability to have all these. 32-bit additions going on. So that's you know non-trivial overhead, but uh, sort of one-off overhead. So we can run that, and there with the Fibonacci numbers. Finally, um, I've also implemented a, um, I've updated the emulator to work like the um, hardware, so I can start the emulator. Uh, well, in fact, let's start the uh, terminal emulator over here. So if I start the emulator, we get the same thing coming out. And again, we have all of these things here. Um, where am I actually in this? So I'm still in the example directory, excellent. Um, we actually have a reset function, which will reset soft reset the computer, which is quite useful. Um, so to give you an idea of the difference in speed between the simulator and the actual hardware, I can run the Fibonacci program. Um, there's some hard-coded timings in the X modem, which gives you some idea of how annoying it is. Okay, and that's been sent, and now we can call it. And you can see quite how slow the emulator is in comparison to the actual real hardware. So the emulator is mostly used to um, allow me to debug the operating system, because burning the ROM is a right pain in the bum. Um, and so this lets me sort of sort out my assembler problems and my problems in that nature, but lets me uh, uh, sort of debug things simply and reload by just sort of restarting the emulator, which is quite nice. Right, so that's all we will have to... We... Right, that's all um, we've got to show this time. Uh, next time, hopefully, we should have even a bit more hardware, or I should have moved it off the breadboard. I don't know. We're going to see which what's going to happen next time. <laughs>